In this video, we're going to take a look at how molecular compounds dissolve. So we're going to focus on um, molecular compounds dissolving in water, because uh, that's our main focus for uh, this unit in chemistry. So remember, the rule is that like dissolves like. So if you have a polar molecular compound, a polar molecular compound, then that may dissolve in water. So for example, sugar is polar, and so it can dissolve in water because water is polar. And the process is very similar to the ionic process with a key difference, and I'll show you that key difference shortly. But the idea is that you um, need to break the intermolecular forces between the solute uh, particles. So for example, if they're dipole-dipole forces, those have to break. Intermolecular forces between the water molecules have to break, so they're hydrogen bonding. And then intermolecular forces between water and the solute particles need to uh, form. Now, um, what I want to emphasize is that when you dissolve an a molecular compound, um, dissociation does not occur. Remember that dissociation results in the production of ions, but ions aren't formed when it comes to dissolving molecular compounds because there are no ions there. Let me give you an example. Suppose we had sugar. I'm going to say glucose. Let's just put C6H12O6. These are two sugar particles. C6 h12 o6 when water wants to dissolve sugar it's going to separate the entire sugar particle over here from this sugar particle here but it's not going to separate the atoms it's not going to do that that's not going to happen so it's not going to separate the atoms it's just going to um, separate the actual particles from each other so i'll have c6 h12 o6 surrounded by water I didn't draw the water particles in here, but it's surrounded by water here. And then over here, I'm going to have C6H12O6 surrounded by water. So in ionic compounds, you actually separate the, I should say, atoms from each other or the ions from each other. So that's why there's dissociation that happens. But in molecular, you're not breaking up the um, individual atoms. You're not separating the individual atoms. You're not creating ions. You're just separating the individual particles of uh, or molecules from each other without breaking them down within. So no ions are formed. There's no dissociation. So for that reason, um, uh, molecular compounds, when you dissolve them in water, they do not conduct electricity. So if you have two compounds that dissolve and you're unsure which one's ionic, or which one's molecular, you can do a conductivity test. And basically, the one that lights up the bulb is the ionic one, and the one that doesn't when it's dissolved in water um, is the uh, molecular one. Uh, and so uh, just to take a look at another image over here, so we can see uh, examples of molecular. Um, so we have some uh, particles of solute over here. Um, and the water surrounds those particles of solute. It doesn't destroy the particle of solute, doesn't separate the atoms. It just grabs the particle of solutes from the larger collection there and surrounds it like that, um, as opposed to forming ions. So uh, you can see over here we have a sodium chloride solution, which is an ionic, ionic solution with ions, and so that would conduct electricity. But here we have a sugar solution um, where the sugar uh, molecules are surrounded, but we didn't separate the um, atoms, so there's no conduction of um, electricity in that case. And then here you can see a summary between uh, the ionic dissolving and the molecular dissolving. So uh, back on the topic of molecular dissolving, uh, we often say that water is universal and can dissolve almost anything, but there are limits. Water doesn't dissolve everything. Water is polar, so it could really only dissolve ionic and polar things. Nonpolar compounds do not dissolve in water. So nonpolar compounds do not dissolve in water. For example, oil will not dissolve in water. So you can see oil over here is a nonpolar compound. Lots of CH bonds are nonpolar there. And water is polar. And again, oil is nonpolar. So they form a layer. They don't mix together. The oil is on top, the water is at the bottom. The water is more dense than the oil because the oil floats on top of the water. Um, and so why is that? Why is it that the nonpolar compounds do not dissolve in water? Well, um, remember that nonpolar compounds essentially have an equal sharing of electrons. Their net dipoles cancel out because of their shape. So they um, do not have those partial or full charges. They do not have partial or full charges. And so because of that, they're only weakly attracted to water and they don't disrupt the hydrogen bonds. 
Um, the hydrogen bonds basically say like, yeah, our bond together is stronger than the bond we could form with you. So we're going to stick together. And the um, nonpolar molecule says, okay, I understand. So we'll stick with our, with our molecules and you stick with your molecules. And that's just the way it goes. Um, so there's two uh, terms that are important when it comes to uh, mixing of substances together. And this usually pertains to liquids. So you can see that oil and water um, do not mix. And so uh, substances, typically liquids, but you could apply it to other states as well. S um, liquids that do not mix are said to be immiscible, immiscible. So oil does not mix with water. So it's, in the, it's immiscible with water. Um, and substances that do mix together, typically liquids that do mix together are well called miscible. They are miscible liquids. It's miscible with water, for example. So liquids that are able to form solutions and mix together. So for example, acetone, which is polar, mixes with water. Or vinegar is acetic acid, it's polar, it mixes with water, so they are miscible. Whereas something like oil and water are immiscible because they do not mix together. And that's just additional terms that um, you'll see in the solubility unit. Uh, so we'll finish off this video with a quick case study on surfactants. Um, surfactants, surfactants are substances that actually allow oil and water to mix. So generally, oil and water won't mix. Even if you shake this up over here, they will eventually um, separate. Um, and so the way surfactants act is that they're, they're substances that will break hydrogen bonds um, to reduce the surface tension of water. Um, now, surfactants have um, two parts to them. They have a water-hating part, so a part that won't interact with water, and that's called hydrophobic. Think water-fearing. And they have a water-loving part that's called hydrophilic, water-loving. Um, and so what will happen is um, they allow water to mix with oil by sort of acting as an in-between, acting as some a, a, a neutral um, party to basically say, hey, let's get along. So here's how it works. Uh, this is an example of a surfactant molecule. Now, this is just a simplified drawing of one. It's actually a big molecule, but we simplify it. We have to give it a head and a tail. The head is a hydrophilic part. It likes water. The tail is a hydrophobic part. It does not like water, but it likes oil. So let's say you have a plate with a lot of grease on it. So you just went to Pizza Hut, for example, and there's tons of grease on your plate, um, and you want to rinse the grease off. Uh, so if you just run water over it, it's not really going to work because the water and oil don't mix. And so it's just going to go straight through and you're not really going to get much cleaning. So what you do is you add maybe some dish soap. And dish soap uh, contains particles that are surf surfactants. And so dish soap might look something like this. You'll notice that the um, heads of the surfactant molecules will um, face on the outside. They'll face on the outside where the water is. And the tails will all surround the grease particles, the oil. And then you can wash off, wash away the oil because the water will carry um, this structure here um, off the plate or off the pan or whatever it was since these um, heads are attracted to the water. Um, so indirectly, it allowed the oil and the water to, um, to mix. Let's go take a, little, take a look at a little bit of a better picture. Um, so we can take a look at this picture over here. Uh, if you look closely, let's uh, present. So if you look closely over here, um, you can see there's some grease on your plate or pan or whatever it is. And these are the surfactant molecules over here. Um, their head is hydrophilic, so it likes water, and their tail is hydrophobic. So the tail will purposely try to arrange itself so that it doesn't face any water and faces something maybe nonpolar. That would be great. And so something nonpolar here might be the dirt or the grease that's over here. So um, you can see the tails are surrounding the greasy part and the heads just face the water. And so now if you flush the water away, the water will carry uh, this whole structure away with it um, to wherever it may be down the sink, for example. Um, and so that's how detergents and certain dish, uh, dish detergents uh, work to allow water and oil to mix in an indirect um, fashion, thanks to this particle that has both polar and nonpolar parts to it. So you might have been asking, is a hydrophobic part nonpolar? It is. And is a hydrophilic part polar? It is. So it's a bit of both parts uh, to that molecules, to that molecule there. 
And so in this video, we saw how uh, molecular compounds dissolve or don't dissolve. So if it's polar, molecular compounds will dissolve. It involves breaking particle attractions between the solutes, breaking particle attraction between the solvent, which is water, and forming particle attraction between the solvent and the solute. Uh, they do not form ions because no dissociation happens. They just separate the individual molecules themselves, not the atoms within it, and as a result, does not conduct electricity. Nonpolar molecules do not dissolve because they don't have those partial charges, and so they're only weakly attracted to the water, and they can't force the water to break their hydrogen bonds. They don't have any convincing argument. It's not a better, um, stronger attraction that they'll form later on. Um, and so we can see oil and water. They don't mix as a result of that. And when you have liquids typically that don't mix, we call them immiscible. But when you have liquids that do mix, so for example, acetone is polar and so is water, and they mix together and can form a solution, we call that miscible. And then finally, we saw surfactant particles, how they essentially work um, within soap to help water indirectly dissolve grease because you have hydrophobic parts and hydrophilic parts within that surfactant particle.